Hello, man. Welcome again to another edition of Seekers of Meaning, uh, the podcast of arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Uh, with these podcasts, we hope to explore some of the issues that touch us, our families, and our congregations in light of the revolution in longevity that is helping to reshape our Jewish world. We appreciate your support. Uh, you can follow us on our website, jewishsacredaging.com. Uh, email me for comments at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. Uh, and uh, we are pleased to welcome as our guest on this edition of Seekers of Meaning, Mr. Lee Gutkin. Um, I hope I pronounced that last name right. Is it Gutkin, Gutkin? Help I, me out I, here, Lee. I, I was waiting for you to take a crack at it. It's Gutkin. Gutkin. Well, yeah. you see, that's that's my Philadelphia accent um, uh, writ large. Anyway, the book uh, that Lee has authored and we're going to talk about is called My Last 8,000 Days, subtitled, I can relate to this, An American Male in His 70s. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is a, a, it's a great read. Thank you, Lee, for joining us uh, from Pittsburgh. And um, welcome. Welcome to Seekers of Meaning. L I have to ask you, starting right up, because in the write-up of the book and the blurb and some of the PR stuff that you sent me, you talk about you being an immersion journalist. That's a phrase that I'm not familiar with. What is an immersion journalist? I'm sure it has nothing to do with a swimming pool. <laughs> well, in some ways, um, it, it might, um, metaphorically. Um, what I do is, I've been writing for a long, long time, and what I do is I spend an enormous amount of time with the people about whom I am writing, not just writing a feature article or parachuting in for a week or two. What we immersion writers do is, uh, like anthropologists, we try to live with or spend as much time as possible in order to see the world, whatever world we're talking about. In my case, I have written about um, through the eyes of organ transplant surgeons, uh, National League baseball umpires, roboticists, veterinarians, child psychiatrists. We try to see that world through the eyes of the person about whom we are writing. And sometimes that takes years. Uh, for my organ transplant book, I spent four years in the organ transplant community. And for my book about robotics, I spent six years off and on in a robotics institute. And so that's what we do. We just immerse ourselves and then try to write the story um, like we're writing fiction, although using all the literary techniques of a fiction writer, but making it true and accurate nonfiction. So immersing, immersing yourself in the world of 70 year old men. Uh, how is that different than writing about the baseball umpire, Mr. Williams? Well, it's a lot different. Um, after, um, after I did write those books, um, um, and after, um, or right before I turned 70, I began to think that I needed to change my life in many different ways. And, um, and I began to understand that even though I was nearly 70 years old, um, I had made some mistakes and I didn't really understand myself and, and uh, how I had conducted myself over the previous uh, many years of my life. And so um, I had done immersions on surgeons, um, lots of immersions on lots of people, but I never, ever took a deep dive into myself before. And I thought that that's what I would try to do, to try to use those techniques I've learned uh, um, to kind of figure out who I was and, um, and, and, and to kind of straighten out my life. Um, as I said to you, um, I thought I, um, uh, I felt like I was in trouble nearing 70. Uh, as a writer, I spend a good deal of time all by myself looking at my keyboard or reading. And whenever I'm in public, in public, as I said to you, I'm with these other people. And so I'm not really with myself. And so um, I had a very small uh, support group. And 
right before that 70th year, um, um, my two best friends died. One died of cancer, um, and one was run over in your neck of the woods, was run over on a highway in, uh, in the darkness of, uh, in South Jersey, nor near, near Northfield, in fact. And, um, and I just felt this great, uh, and then, and then five days, um, uh, before my 70th birthday, my mom died. And I just thought, um, um, I felt alone. I felt scared. I was 70 years old. God knows how many more days, months, years I was going to be able to live. And, and, and I, and there was no one around to help me or to support me. And so, um, that I trusted. And so that's why I decided to take the deep dive into myself. Yeah, you write you write about the loss and um, this idea that we talk about a lot in our work in Jewish sacred aging, that as we get older, as life deals us cards that usually we don't anticipate, that the circles, the circles of our relationships slowly diminish and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it raises, as we talk about in some of our workshops, it, it really does raise the issue of one's own mortality and the reality of that um, that comes into focus. So the idea that, you know, as a writer, uh, it, it tri perhaps trigger this, well, maybe I need to, to look at this, uh, which obviously is, I, I would assume, as you're describing it, the genesis of, of my last 8,000 days. Um, so as you, as you walk this walk and as you immerse yourself in this, uh, the popular, there's a lot of popular mythology about 70 is the new 50, which I don't particularly agree with. But anyway, wh what's your take on that? I mean, it, 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 it this, um, is, is, is 70 the new 50? It's the new 40? Or is this all, as we say in the tradition, kaka? Uh, yeah, it's all, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a nice little phrase and it's good to, good to joke about and, and good to use, um, especially if, uh, you want to seem younger than you are, but, um, I think 70 is 70. Um, and, um, I think that what we make of ours, I, I think that we can make a lot of ourselves at 70 and that we don't need to act like, or even say that it's like 50. It's not like 50. It's like 70. We've lived that long. You know that. And I know that. And we have learned a great deal. We have made mistakes and we, and we have also learned a great deal from our 70 years. So it ain't the new 50. Um, it is just the fact that if right now, if you live till 65 years old, you have got a good chance, 50, 60% chance to live uh, until you are 90. And so that's really quite terrific. And to know that at 65, we've got two decades left if everything goes well. And I, and, and I think the real challenge is to make the absolute positive most of those two decades. Uh, and um, both for ourselves and for other people as well. You're right a little bit. And, and, and in the context of the flow of the book, um, one of the things that I, I wrote down that I wanted to ask you about is looking backwards and also looking forwards. What's the role of regret? The role of regret. There's so many people that we talk to, you know, they, they still look backward. You know, uh, they as we talk about in some of our workshops, they live too much in the land of woulda, shoulda, coulda, or, or if only I had done it, but you can't change that. How do you, you know, as you wrote about this and reflected upon this in your own life, how do, how do you deal with regret? I think I said in the book that uh, I don't believe in regret. Um, and, um, I, um, I, I think there's a difference between, um, um, uh, talking about the mistakes you've made and talking about regret. I think that um, we can look at our lives and we can figure out what we thought about and what we did that was successful and well. And then um, uh, look at our lives and say, okay, this didn't go too well. I made a mistake, okay? But I tried really hard to do the right thing. And it wasn't in the end the right thing, but but in my heart I know that 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 if 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 
if the if if the circumstance arose again, twenty years, if I could walk back twenty or thirty or forty years, knowing what I knew then, I would undoubtedly make the same decision. So it's a mistake, and we're all human. And rabbi, even rabbis make mistakes, and um, we all make mistakes. And 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 <laughs> there's, a, there's a rumor to that effect. Yes, there is a rumor to that effect. <laughs> so so I so. So uh, I don't think there should be room for uh, regret because because there's nothing you can do about it except do it better if you have the opportunity the next time and 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 have faith in yourself um, um, that you did your best at the time and I have made so many mistakes but I look back and I think at the time I did the right thing for me and for the other people involved. So you write about um, uh, towards the beginning the, the the idea of aging as a silent process. I think is a word that you use. Um, the, this transition and slowly you are aware of it, and you, ref you 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 talk about this incident. If I remember correctly, at a restaurant we were just talking about at Klein's restaurant in Pisa. Is that still? Is it still there? Is Klein still there? No, 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 it's not. No. When, when I when I left. It, it, it's probably <laughs> what I'm. <doing. laughs> so, I mean, it, you talk about you know going to Kleins and it, it talks a little bit about that that vignette, that part of the book, because um, I do remember that we talked about before we started recording the the garlic bread that they're garlic knots. Uh, I think yeah. they come in a basket. They were really delicious and not very healthy, but they were really, really, really good. <laughs> So talk, talk to me a little bit about that incident at Klein's and this whole concept of transitioning to aging. And and um, you, you talk about it as a silent process. It's not just wake up one morning and say, oh, my God, look what happened. Right. Um, um, yeah, I can so clearly remember, as uh, some of the people that I've talked about with, um, that um, so you're, you're – um, you're always trying to get to an age. When you're nine, you want to get to thirteen and and have your bar mitzvah. And when you're when you're fourteen, you want to get to sixteen so you can get a driver's license. And then eighteen so that you can vote or wherever you are, or twenty one so you can vote. And there's always something else. And then there's people who are telling you constantly when you're young, you'll understand when you get a little bit older, or you'll qualify for this job after you have two or three more years experience you're always moving forward to get to this point of aging where you're old enough to do something and then suddenly one day whenever that is out of the blue suddenly um, you realize that that's not going to, Rabbi, that's just not going to happen anymore. Um, uh, now you're trying to figure out what am I going to do for the rest of my life while I live this long? Or I, will I be young enough to get a new job and make a change and go somewhere else? Um, um, it's all quite different. And so one day you just wake up and, and you realize that to use this, uh, um, my, um, my, um, my, my, um, the surgeons I wrote about often when they discussed the patient, um, who was uh, dying, uh, they always would say, um, they would sometimes say, and this was not a mean thing to say, uh, that they were, um, that the patient was circling the drain. And, um, and suddenly you feel, or at least suddenly I felt on this day you're describing that I too was about ready to start circling the aging drink. And, um, and, and this happened when my wife took me to this really nice or what I, what, what well-known, traditionally well-known restaurant called Klein's in Pittsburgh. And I walked in and, um, maybe there were those garlic nuts you were talking about, but, um, everywhere I looked around and everyone was so old. They were so old in that restaurant that they were older. They were, that, that they were as old as I am now. And, um, and, and and there were parts in the carpet that were kind of rubbed. You could look through the carpet and 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 see the wooden floor below. And and I I don't know what happened, Rabbi, but I but I suddenly started thinking um, that that this was me. 
and um, and <laughs> and I was in my grave, and you could look through and see my bones through those carpet fibers. And I sat down at the table, and I felt more and more depressed as I looked around. And uh, suddenly, without any warning to my wife, who was uh, who was a very nice lady, um, uh, I jumped up and fled. I was so scared. It was my 40th birthday, and I thought this was the moment I was circling the age drain. And um, and I ran. I mean, well, I waited for my wife. She paid the bill and all that stuff, whatever bill there was. And um, and and I ran home and crawled into bed uh, under the sheets and um, watched a mash rerun or watched a mash show. And the funny thing about it is. Um, it, this time I was so damn old um, that it wasn't a rerun. So, um, so that's what happened on my 40th birthday. And uh, it's a long story. I'm sorry, but um, um, uh, but it's it it just kind of takes you through the uh, the way in which you 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 think about and orient yourself about age. First, it's all to come, and then it's all going to be gone. It's like time, you know, when you're a kid and you sit in the classroom and you watch the clock and time goes so slowly as you were talking about. And then you get to be our age and whew, it's like, wait a minute, to slow yeah. down, you know, stop, stop. <laughs> hit the pause button. Hit the pause button. You, <laughs> are, as you wrote this and reflected, how scared are you of dying? I'm not. I'm not scared of dying as much as I am afraid of being uh, unable to be productive and to think clearly. Um, um, that's what um, and and to and and to continue to be a part of um, whatever society I choose to be a part of. That scares me to death. It really does. And um, and um, and and I have to work. We all people our age have to work really, really hard um, to continue to um, engage with other people and to continue to do things that, that satisfy us and help us feel productive and keep our minds and our bodies sharp. And I really and truly believe that it has, um, I'm, I'm going to be 78 uh, in about a month and a half. And uh, since I wrote that book, I've gone through a number of surgeries. I've had prostate cancer. Um, I've had, it has metastasized. Um, and, but I, um, and, and I'm okay now. I'm hanging in there. Um, but um, but uh, I, um, um, what helps me hang in is my connection to the bigger world in every way possible. And, um, and, that's, and, and if I can't do that, Rabbi, that's what scares me. And, and, not, and not at this moment, dying. So we're talking uh, with the author of My Last 8,000 Days, an American male in his 70s, uh, Lee Goodkin from Pittsburgh. And Lee... The subtitle, American Male in His 70s. How more difficult, if that's correct English, how more difficult is it for us, for men, in our 70s and 80s to talk about this? Because this literature, there seems to be, you know, that it's easier for women. They have a wider collection of selection or connection network men do. And there's all kinds of the male ego involved. But in your writing, in your research, and in your own personal life, is it tougher for us to talk about this stuff? And if so, why? Yeah, um, that's such a good question. Um, um, I, I would say that if there are, if there are strengths in my book, uh, my last 8,000 days, um, the main strength is that I come as clean as I possibly can. And, 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 and I'm trying to be, um, in these last 8,000 days as honest and, um, with myself and with the world as I possibly can be. And, um, and, and I don't think that that is something that most men, um, uh, want to do, although they may well be able to do it. I've, I've gotten a lot of response from my book, um, um, but um, mostly 
the positive, um, the, the reinforcing stuff has come from women and not men. And it's not as if it's not as if men don't say, "I love your book." Because I could really relate to it, but they don't want to go any deeper at all. Um, it's like almost as if for some men, I've given them too much information. They don't want to think about some of the things that I have thought about, and um, but I think it's really crucial that um, that that um, that men try to dig a little bit deeper beyond beyond their psychiatrists' couches um, to um, uh, to find to try to find the truth in their life, and and because they're going to not only be able to understand themselves more but they're going to be able to understand women more and and uh, which is pretty important for men and um and kind of make these connections that they have been missing for so long and so it's not it's not so embarrassing to say things about yourself that that um that might minimize you or 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 make you um seem lesser than the god you think you are but um but uh, i think it's really important that we try to do that and men have difficulty doing that if um i'm in this writing world and i have written um a memoir and if you kind of look at memoirs at, in the publishing industry uh 80 percent of memoirs uh are written by women because you have to kind of come out and talk about your life and your feelings and men are challenged to do that in your experience and in your writing and in reflection is despite all the terminology and you know baby boomers and is america still in your opinion an ageist society do we still focus everything on the too much on the young Oh my God! Um, there are, depending upon who you talk to, there are uh, approximately fifty million people um, who are beyond, who are age sixty-five or beyond, and um, we are not. And maybe that figure is is, is even higher. Um, um, but um, but we don't pay much attention. Uh, in fact, we try not to pay too much attention to those people who are elderly, who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. I would like to see, um, 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 about 20 years ago, Japan did this really cool thing. They, um, they uh, established a uh, respect and honor the, a the elderly day. And um, and um, that, that's kind. Of, I mean, it's just one day, and and one day is not enough. But um, but I think that we need to really begin to focus on how we can maximize the effectiveness, the productivity, and the lives of the peop of people who are who are now aging. Um, um, uh, one credible example is the guy who's going to be, who is the next, going to be the next president of the United States. More often than not, one of the criticisms was not of his politics, but of his age. Um, and his voice cracked. Um, um, he made a few mistakes. He forgot a few things. It's like, it's like when you're 20, you don't make a mistake and forget a few things. Um, it's just that when you do it and you're elderly, um, uh, it's because you're old, not because you forgot. And I think that we really need to start working um, on preserving our respectability. And I also think that we need to start getting mad at other people who don't, who try to be nice to us, but um, but also don't really see us. I mean, the whole word retire drives me crazy. Um, it means, what does it mean in, 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 in this world? I am retiring. Oh, that means you're not gonna work anymore. Maybe you're gonna play golf. Maybe you're gonna smell the roses. Uh, maybe you're gonna go to Florida. It, it doesn't mean that it, you've kind of, means that you've canceled yourself out of life. That drives me crazy. Um, I don't want, um, I, I have no interest in canceling myself out of life. And, and I think that we need to start um, 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 demanding from um, the people we know um, uh, more attention and not to be fluffing us off as people who were once significant, but are now just fading away. No, I, I, I agree. I, I never use the word retirement. 
Uh, I always use the word transition because so many of our generation have transitioned from full time work. Now they're doing full time volunteer work or they're giving back or they're or they're pursuing um, things that they've just didn't have time to do when they were raising a family. And and they're just transitioning, um, which I think is a healthier way of, of looking at it. But there's also this, and I, I, I wanted to, and as I was reading the book, one of the things I wrote down there is I wanted to ask you about your view on this, on the, on the anti-aging uh, industry. You know, uh, you're going to, we're going to do this. You're going to live longer. You're going to live to 120. There's scientists now who are working on this. There are people on television. There's organizations of anti-aging. Um, what, what's your take on this? Is this, I mean, seriously, what, you're in a, you studied this, you What's your take on this? Um, I, um, <laughs> my take is I have no take. That is to say, um, I don't have, look, I'm 78 years old. I don't have a lot of time to, um, to think about things that I think are so far out of uh, something that we should really um, uh, invest our energies in. Um, I honestly feel... Um, um, that we got to live every day and um and and live it as well as possible and i listen to this stuff um i watch a lot of tv but um but but um but i'm not going to buy into it and we don't have time rabbi um we don't have time to buy into things just for fun we have to buy in or we have to buy into things that we feel are really going to matter i'm, I'm now what I, I lost I lost your audio for a bit. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, you're back. Okay, so you 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 write it towards the end of the book that the, that the goal in life I think I've got this correct is to get <laughs> old and to stay old as long as possible, which is really cool, which is very very cool. You know, it's uh, you know, let's keep going, baby. Let's keep going. No, no, that's <laughs> right. But, Right, I got up today. Let's rock and roll. Exactly. Um, before we run out of time, Lee, the, how has the pandemic and the isolation and the shutdowns and this whole sort of like aura of uh, you know the daily tally of people dying? How, how has it affected you, or has it? Well, um, I'm fortunate in fact, because it has not affected me nearly as much as it has uh, lots of folks that I know, especially my age. Because I, as I mentioned a little bit before, um, I spend tons of time on my own in my office, looking right now, looking at this keyboard and at this display. So, so I am used to being alone. I am used to not um, necessarily getting tons of uh, people knocking on my door. And so it was not a terrible transition at all, um, um, as it has been for some friends. And um, I've also, um, uh, as, as you'll see in the book, um, as you know in the book, one of the things that I did when I felt that I needed to make a change was to kind of focus on finding new friends and and getting out, um, finding places to go where there are people that plea that 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 uh, I, I would want to talk to and connect with, and I did that quite successfully. And over the over a period of three or four years, I've made a brand new um, circle of friends. Most of them much younger than me, but who cares? But so I haven't stopped doing that now um, with masks and that is an, an isolation. That is to say that um, I get out, I don't go near people, um, but I, 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 um, I reach out to them. I talk to people. They may be eight feet away from me, but I talk to them. And, um, and I try as hard as I can to continue to engage in one way or the other. And I have made a lot of, um, a number of masked friends. Um, I, I recognize them more by their mask than I do from by their nose or eyes, but it doesn't really matter. And so I've tried real hard. And as I said, I'm lucky because loneliness is the life of a long distance writer. Right. An immersion journalist. Lee, 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 good. Uh, the author of 8, 000, my last 8,000 days. And I, I, 
I, I wish you luck for the next 8,000 days uh, and good health. Mm-hmm. Subtitle of the book, An American Male in His 70s, um, available, I guess, at bookstores, but also on Amazon, I'm sure. And yeah. um, I thank you for your time. I really do. A, it, it's a, a really good, whoops, there we go, a really good read. Um, and thank you very much. Continue. Good luck. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, and I appreciate your time, Lee. Thank you very, very much. Can I say my website? You so- oh, please do. Okay, it's Lee Goodkin, L E E G U T K I N D dot com, and you'll be able to order the book from that website, um, from all kinds of different uh, vendors. Plus, uh, take a look at some of my other books and um, and and uh, the speech, the the talks I've given. So, thank you. Super. Thank you. Tadaraba. Thank you very much. Just take care of yourself. Be well. You Be too. well. Thank you. And all of you, thank you again for uh, listening and watching today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of uh, Jewish Sacred Aging. Remember that uh, the podcast, these programs are available also on your Roku uh, uh, hookup machine, whatever the right word is on your computer. And um, we welcome again your comments to me, Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com, and we invite you to visit our Facebook page, Jewish Sacred Aging, on Facebook. And if you'd like to make a tax-free donation to help support the work of uh, Jewish Sacred Aging, go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and just click on the Donate button. Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubeck and Media Companies in beautiful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out and thank you to our producer, Steve Lubeck. Once again, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and I look forward to greeting you on our next Seekers of Meaning TV and podcast. Toda, shalom, stay healthy, stay safe.